Okay, everybody, welcome back. We are pushing full steam ahead through Unit 5, and then we'll do a quickie Unit 6, and then it's final exam time. So these are um, pretty much the only notes that, you'll, that you had to read out of the textbook. It's on chemical bonding, um, and a chemical bond is just a, a name of the force that holds atoms together. So when we were looking at elements, compounds, mixtures, and solutions, I talked about atoms being stuck together, and when those atoms are stuck together, they're held together by what we call a chemical bond. We are learning about two main kinds of chemical bonds. There are others, but these are the two basic we're going to learn about. And the first one's called ionic bonds, and the second are covalent. Ionic bonds are between ions, and we've been doing a lot of work on what kind of ion will an atom be based on its number of valence electrons. Covalent bonds, um, you, you won't have ions because um, the atoms involved are going to share uh, electrons. And in ionic bonds, that's where we talked about some of the elements being weak and some of the elements being strong, is that a strong element will take an, atom, uh, an electron away from a weaker atom of an element. So to review, we said uh, when we use the word atom, it means that our particle is neutral, we write the symbol, and it means that the electrons and the pro excuse me, the protons are equal. If they are not equal, that's when we have an ion. And actually, a positive ion has a fancy name. It's called a cation. And we always say the T should remind you that it's positive. And that means there are less el electrons, which are the negative charges, than the protons, which are positive charges. And we write it with the symbol and a superscript, and we put the charge there. Sometimes you'll see potassium plus, and when you see just a plus, it implies that there is a positive charge, and it implies that it's a 1. Oops, sorry about that. All right, so potassium has 19 protons and 19 electrons, but potassium, its electron dot diagram is this. We talked last Friday that it's easier for potassium to let go of this one electron. And then its next um, uh, underneath shell of electrons is full. And so potassium would be considered to be um, ha have a stable arrangement. And so now potassium has 19 protons but only 18 electrons. And when we do the math, we end up with a plus one charge on the atom. This potassium is very nice and giving. It gave away one electron, so it's positive one. Oppositely, anions are negative, and I always remember the N for negative. Oh, I was trying to use another color here. N for negative, and that means um, there are more electrons, negative charges, than pro positive charges. And likewise, we write it with the symbol and the superscript with one negative. Sometimes, again, you see it F negative, again, implying negative one. This is a fluorine that went out and took an electron from someone else, maybe a potassium. And now the fluorine has 10 electrons um, and only nine protons. So 10 negative charges and nine positives, giving it an, a uh, negative one charge overall. And uh, the old-fashioned term for this is gains. They gain a negative charge. And the old-fashioned term for the, for the positive ions is that they lose. Um, I found just with how we learn math when we're really little kids, um, it's a little bit opposite to what we're thinking with the charges. So that's why I try to focus on positive ions giving away electrons and negative, electron, uh, negative ions taking electrons. Um, because this taking is a you know, negative kind of language and the giving away is a positive language. If that can help you remember the difference between what a cation happens with its electrons and what happens with an anion and its electrons. All right, so our very quick review. Now, how do atoms know how many electrons they're going to take, give, or share? And that's this octet rule that we also discussed last week. Atoms are seeking a stable arrangement of outer electrons. And right now, stable is 8, except for hydrogen and helium. They're stable at 2. Everybody else needs 8 valence electrons to be stable. So that's what we call the octet rule. Atoms are trying to get that full 8 outer shell. And then um, 
basically, and it really comes down to looking at the periodic table, which is the best cheat sheet ever. How do we know what electrons are going to be transferred or shared? How, um, how many? How do we know um, how many? And how do we know do they transfer or share? So we'll know how many in just a minute. But we know that um, if the atoms are not equal in strength, electrons are transferred. And that's this ionic bond where our metal will be positive, our non-metal will be negative. So you have to look at the periodic table. And if your atoms are from opposite sides of the table, it will be an ionic bond. And if your atoms are from the same side of the table and are equal in strength, that's when the electrons are shared. And I liken this to two little kids fighting over a ball. If they have equal strength, they'll both hang on to that ball as long as they can. And that's what's happening in covalent bonds. We share electrons. All right, I'm going to switch over really quick for ionic bonding. There's some things you need to know. They're always between a metal and a nonmetal, so opposite sides of the table. The electrons are transferred. This is not a word, but in ionically bonded atoms, the atoms are held together by those opposite charges, by the positive and the negative, and they attract each other like magnets. We call the combination of atoms that are held with an ionic bond a compound, and we call the formula a unit formula. Um, when you draw a Lewis dot structure, you won't have to draw one when you identify one, you'll see the positive and the negative and you'll see this arrow indicating that sodium gave an electron to chlorine. So sodium becomes positive, chlorine becomes negative, and they stick together like magnets. Um, and then there's properties of ionic bonds. There is a test question on it. Um, ionic bonds are good conductors of electricity and heat. They have high melting points. They're usually crystalline solids, and they dissolve easy in water. And then there's this group of um, joined atoms called polyatomic ions, and the ion itself is, um, the internal bonds of the ion are covalent, but this whole piece will act like a single atom. I call them like a clique of atoms, like a group of young ladies. They all go to the bathroom together. These ions will stick together through thick and thin, and they won't split up. Um, usually when we're talking about chemical reactions. You won't need to know the names, but they're common and just so that you recognize them. We have nitrate, sulfate, phosphate, ammonium, hydroxide. Um, there's another one you'll see all the time, bicarbonate. And I don't remember its charge right offhand. I'd have to look it up. Um, those are all examples of polyatomic ions. And these are um, problematic in that we look at them and we go, oh my gosh, what is that? So don't worry about it. If it looks big and hairy, it's a polyatomic ion. The last little bit of uh, bonding information are covalent bonds specifically. They're always two or more nonmetals. The electrons are shared. Um, we call a combination of covalently bonded atoms a molecule. And here is the electron dot diagram of covalently bonded molecules. Um, and you'll see these circles, which indicate shared pairs of electrons. Um, and the properties of substances with covalent bonds is opposite ionic bonds. They're pore conductors. They have low melting points. They're solids, liquids, or gases, and they don't dissolve easily. Um, and there are many elements that exist normally in covalently bonded pairs. Um, we call them diatomic atoms or diatomic elements. And I'll show you on the periodic table in class how you start at ad element number 7, nitrogen, and you make a gigantic 7 on the periodic table. So it goes from nitrogen over to the halogen family, down to the bottom of the halogen family, and also hydrogen. All right, those that is the, the down low and dirty on bonding. Um, I hope that you were able to get more information or have clarification of your information. And in class, we're going to come up to how we write formulas for uh, molecules and compounds. And then from there, we'll go on to how do we write uh, a chemical equation. Okay, if you have questions, as always, email. Thanks for watching. Bye.